Okay, uh, so let me first uh, uh, talk uh, uh, about a little bit about our current full-time faculty. Uh, 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 Jeff Dick, uh, professor, he started uh, uh, 2003. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Corey uh, Glockner, uh, who's here, right? He's a new guy in town. Uh, 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 Steve Herbert, uh, 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 he's provost uh, and is on the physics faculty but has not taught uh, any class in the department. Uh, Navid Peracha, I don't know where he is. Oh, I'm here. Uh, okay. Right, and uh, I started uh, working here at John Carroll uh, in 2002, uh, and we have Dinesh Shetty, who is not here today, uh, and he has completed his four years as a visitor, and we will be saying goodbye to him by the end of the semester. Okay, and uh, our part-time faculty, uh, Jeff Kriesler is uh, uh, our part-time lecturer. He, he, he comes and helps us sometimes. Uh, Roy Day is a professor emeritus, retired from the department, and he is here, right? Uh, uh, retired from the department and uh, uh, many years ago, but we are lucky that whenever we need him, uh, he is always ready to jump in uh, to teach a class or two. So his, we are really, uh, really very happy uh, whenever we have an issue in, in uh, finding someone to come and teach, uh, we always count uh, uh, Roy in, and uh, good thing to have. Uh, Jay Damal, she uh, is our new admin assistant. She joined very recently in March this year. Bob Kehoe, uh, a professor at SMU, has his own research group, but enjoy spending his summers in Cleveland and mentoring our summer research student. Okay, now I'll be talking a little bit in more detail about our full-time faculty. Uh, one more time, Jeff uh, Dake, so that uh, I, I will tell a uh, little bit about his research interest. So, uh, photovoltaic materials, thermoelectric materials, uh, diluted magnetic semiconductor, electrical and thermal transport properties and measurement, and here uh, collaboration with Case Western River University. Uh, he has uh, uh, the teaching, uh, uh, his teaching interests are in thermal physics, condensed matter physics, teaching introductory um, um, calculus-based uh, physics, and recently he's developing uh, a physics of sport, a core class that he uh, wants to teach, and he's very enthusiastic about it, I know that, and uh, and uh, it will definitely become a popular class, especially among our exercise science majors. Uh, some uh, of his recent publications here. Okay. Right, and now we have uh, Corey Glockner. Uh, I I downloaded this picture from internet. I don't know. Maybe that would be right. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, PhD in biomedical engineering, University of Minnesota. PhD in another PhD, two PhD. PhD in theology, University of Pretoria. Uh, his research interests are in neural engineering and brain-computer interface (BCI) uh, that uh, detect brain activity non-invasively, uh, also carries out research in, in theology. Okay, and uh, his teaching interests are basically, that's what he's doing, developing and teaching engineering physics courses, uh, introductory physics labs, engineering, uh, uh, physics development, uh, engineering physics curriculum development, and he is our focal person on ABAT. Okay. Uh, he's also uh, the faculty sponsor of JCU's chapter of, uh, chap uh, of Society of Physics Student. Some of his recent publications. Okay. Uh, then it's me here. 
Uh, my uh, research is uh, using spectroscopy to seek uh, information on atomic structure, spectroscopic constant, discharge dynamics, plasma parameters. I use uh, techniques like octogalvanic spectroscopy and laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, uh, and I create discharges uh, in, uh, in, 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 some, in discharge cells. And, uh, uh, then using uh, spectroscopy with uh, uh, tunable lasers. Uh, I have collaboration uh, at two places in Pakistan. One is uh, QA University, which is basically Kai De Azam University, we call it QA University, and uh, National Center for Physics in Pakistan. Uh, my teaching interests are laser spectroscopy, some ACBC circuits, analog and digital electronics, general physics, intro physics lab, and I teach uh, a class, How Things Work, which is a, a core class for non-science majors. Though our physics major also take that class, it's, uh, but they think normally it's really easy and it should be easy for them. Uh, uh, my recent publication here, uh, uh, some of those publication here, here. Uh, so this is our, uh, we, so we have a faculty line, uh, three faculty line here, but uh, uh, in, uh, in, in earlier in uh, this year, uh, we hired another uh, faculty member. He is uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin Grossman Ponimon. He is an engineer, PhD in mechanical engineering from St uh, Stanford University. Uh, he will be joining us in the fall um, and he is a postdoctoral researcher uh, in Brown University, uh, so he'll be be be, be coming soon uh, uh, and uh, starting his lab and and, and uh, other stuff. Uh, his research expertise in computational mechanics. Current research in uh, is on developing numerical methods and uh, sensor algorithms to study human body motion. Uh, for the purpose of preventing traumatic brain injury. And uh, here you can see him uh, wearing uh, inertial sensors on his body. Uh, and uh, he will be teaching uh, in the fall 2023 some introductory physics classes for pre-health students. Uh, his recent publications. Okay. Uh, now I'll be talking uh, uh, a little bit about student activities uh, uh, and I want to share with you some of the activities that they did including summer research and, and internships uh, and what you see over here is uh, uh, the, the student talks in the physics colloquia uh, and it is based on the summer work so that's what they presented uh, they did uh, like research or internship and then they gave talks uh, in the physics colloquia. And uh, uh, Victoria, for example, here, uh, she's sitting somewhere here. Uh, uh, Matt Sarson, uh, Gabe, uh, Alex, and Jacob. Uh, so, uh, and uh, Mike, uh, Michael Roth, uh, he uh, presented this, this poster in uh, spring meeting of the APS. Eastern Great Lakes uh, uh, section. On the other side, we have uh, Daniel Austin. Uh, uh, he uh, is, uh, you can see, he's very enthusiastic. He's showing his uh, engineering physics project, uh, which is based on Arduino. Uh, and uh, here, some of more, uh, you can see, uh, our current juniors, so this, this, this left side picture on this side is, uh, 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 they were sophomores last year and uh, they are having fun in their ACDC circuit class. Uh, and uh, over here is Nivan and uh, Kalen. Uh, they are helping the department with recruitment event. Okay, so those were some student activities and uh, uh, now I'll talk a little bit about uh, ABAT. Uh, as most of you know, our engineering uh, physics program has entered 
uh, in a new era of ABAT uh, uh, accreditation. The goals and strategies of the program are evolving. We have completely revamped uh, engineering physics curriculum to include multiple new classes, each with a significant focus on application-based learning. We hired already two PhD engineering faculty members. We have increased uh, required engineering credit hours. Uh, we have updated engineering physics curriculum. Uh, senior design has been expanded to six credit, uh, credits across a full uh, academic year, allowing for a more comprehensive experience. We are working on enhancing engineering infrastructure and, and acquiring more internships and industry-sponsored projects. With the modified uh, uh, curriculum, students are now prepared to take the fundamentals of engineering, which is, FE, which is called as FE exam, and which is required for uh, eventual professional licensure. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, Cody's role in the development of the uh, engineering uh, program and engineering uh, uh, program's new curriculum, basically. He spent a lot of time in, uh, in, 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 in uh, basically developing uh, the engineering physics uh, curriculum. Okay, uh, so we are upgrading our existing labs and are adding new equipment to satisfy the department's increasing need. Uh, So as you see here uh, now, uh, some research, uh, uh, some recent alumni placement, uh, our graduates go to all sorts of related fields, some go to graduate schools, uh, as you can see down there, astronomy graduate uh, student at the University of Toledo and PhD candidate in applied biomedical engineering, uh, and, and, and other students, they enter in the workforce directly. So some information is here, class of 2022 and class of uh, 2021. Okay, uh, now uh, we, we, we always appreciate student help. Uh, and uh, you can see here, they are uh, lab TAs, tutors, and volunteers. So uh, please put your hands together for Paige, Daniel, uh, Nivan, uh, Sarah, Kalen, Matt, and, and Gabe. So they helped us a lot, no doubt about that, being, being lab TAs, being uh, uh, tutors, and especially uh, volunteers. Uh, and uh, to acknowledge all that, we have uh, uh, some awards for them, some like souvenirs, small souvenirs for them. So uh, if you see your name, please come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nevon. Thank you. Nevon. Thank you very much. Caleb. Uh, Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, okay. Alumni sport. Right. And uh, uh, so let's talk about alum alumni sport. We have uh, many endowed um, academic scholarships uh, and research and internship funds. And we are very thankful to our alumni for this uh, 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 big help. 
we have endowed uh, uh, academic scholarship that sports around 17 this uh, in the year 2022-23 uh, sporting 17 PHEP uh, students. Uh, DARDI is a really good scholarship for financial aid um, uh, and then Xavier Nichols uh, is for female uh, uh, physics majors. Uh, other endowed funds include uh, uh, internships for students, uh, uh, summer internships. Uh, then uh, uh, there is a fund called, called, called as Monville Hunter Fund that supports junior faculty. Uh, Jeff and I got benefited uh, from that fund a lot. We, uh, our initial lab setup, uh, all funding came from uh, Monville Hunter Fund. Uh, and now uh, Corey is benefited, uh, benefiting from that fund for his research needs. Uh, so uh, let's uh, give a round of applause to our alumni for their great <laughs> Okay. Right. Uh, next thing on the agenda is now Society of Physics Students uh, and Sigma Pi Sigma Induction. Uh, so I'll ask the SPX students to come forward and uh, talk about SPX and Sigma Pi Sigma Induction. So George, uh, Kalen, and Jack and Gabe would be here. You need to come from that side, or maybe that's fine. There you go. Thank you. Is that okay? Yeah. So first, I would like to introduce myself. My name is George Pantalimon, uh, and I've been a Sigma Pi Sigma student. Um, I've been a member for a year now, and this year I have the honor of introducing our new members. So I would like to start by saying it is a pleasure on behalf of the John Carroll University uh, Physics Department and the Society of Physics Students to welcome you to the Annual Awards uh, Banquet. In particular, it is a pleasure to welcome the new members of uh, Sigma Pi Sigma. The primary objective of uh, Sigma Pi Sigma is to serve as a means of awarding distinction to those of high scholarship and promise um, in physics. And we congratulate you for uh, having attained distinction in this department by our scholarship and by your achievements. Sigma Pi Sigma and the Society of Physics Students are a linked but distinct set of societies. The Society of Physics Students has uh, over 800 chapters, welcomes everyone with an uh, interest in physics and astronomy, and is open to everyone. Sigma Pi Sigma is the corresponding physics honor society, which invites students to join uh, for high academic achievements and uh, service, or those within the field for service to the community. With over 100, time, with, uh, over 100,000 lifetime members, Sigma Pi Sigma strives to provide a lifelong uh, connection to each member's alma mater, and the broader physics and astronomy community. Sigma Pi Sigma strives to uphold this mission, to honor outstanding scholarship in physics, to encourage interest in physics among students uh, at all levels, to promote an attitude of service of its members towards uh, their fellow students, colleagues, and the public, and to provide a fellowship of persons who have excelled in physics and astronomy. The motto of the society, tra translated from Greek, is investigation, the forerunner of knowledge. Our name, Sigma Pi Sigma, comes from the first letters of this motto. The motto emphasizes the experiments, um, that experiments are the basis of progress in science. The key is the original design. It has the shape of the historic standard voltmeter. Arched across the top is the name of the society. In the apex of the key is an incandescent lamp connected to a dynamo in the center. The pin, which symbolizes your membership in the society, has this shape. The founders of the society has the standard voltmeter, to symbolize the high accuracy, which is the hallmark of uh, careful experiments. The lamp is the symbol of knowledge, and the dynamo represents the creative energy that is so necessary to productive research. The official insignia consists of an outline figure of the key with a scroll superimposed on the stem. Um, the Greek word uh, pronounced sophia, or knowledge, is written on the scroll. Seal um, is a circle with the name of the society around the top. The Greek word uh, physeka, the root word for physics, is in the center. At the bottom is the founding date of Sigma Pi Sigma. I would now like to induct our new members into Sigma Pi Sigma. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to Sigma Pi Sigma. You are meeting here today with a group of people who have a real and enduring interest in physics. 
We believe in the importance of physics as a basic science, as a contributor to everyday life, and as a foundation for the developments in engineering and technology. We are glad to include you as a member of the society and hope you will continue your growth as a scientist or engineer. The final act for your reception into Sigma Pi Sigma consists of having you recite the Sigma Pi Sigma statement and sign the membership book of the John Carroll Sigma Pi Sigma chapter, which has been signed by every inductee since 1975. In doing so, it will be understood that you will endeavor to maintain the John Carroll chapter of Sigma Pi Sigma and SPS, and to support on an active basis the programs of the, international, of, uh, the national organization. Inductees, please stand. Together, please stand and recite the oath of Sigma Pi Sigma, which is shown on the PowerPoint. Um, and uh, as I call your name, please come forward to receive your pin and certificate and to sign the membership book after. Please go ahead. Encourage those seeking knowledge and confidence in business and trauma. Develop and maintain an attitude of service. Support colleagues who promote friendship and honor excellence in physics and trauma. And encourage scholarship in physics and trauma at all levels. Now, like I said, as I call your name, please come forward to receive your opinion certificate and to sign the membership book. Kaylin Blakely. Zachary McElroy. And finally, Gabriel Williford. It is now my privilege to declare you to be a member of Sigma by Sigma. Dolly and the Fisher received the having of all the rights and privileges of members of the society. Okay, so back on our on track. Uh, let uh, let me introduce now our graduating uh, uh, class of uh, 2023, uh, and. Uh, uh, after which we will have a special award, and then we will hear from our distinguished uh, alum. Okay, uh, class of 2023 is here, and uh, well, the, you see here. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, would you like to stand up? Okay. <laughs> Joe is here, so. Just, just for science. Oh. <laughs> so this is what happens when you come to John Carroll in your freshman year, you are like this, and when you are done... <laughs> you might lose all your hair. Sorry? You might lose all your hair. Uh, you might lose all your hair. <laughs> so, thank you, John. Thank mm. you. Okay. Okay. So this is our tradition. We normally add a picture from their freshman year, uh, and uh, so that uh, just to get an idea uh, how would they look when they when they came here uh, uh, in their in their, in their uh, uh, freshman year. Okay. Uh, uh, Joe is also doing a, a senior project, control of uh, uh, cursor using brain computer interface B BCI uh, uh, with Dr. Corey Glockner. Uh, Future plans, gap year before uh, PA program uh, or graduate school, right? Okay. Well, uh, the next one is Zach. Zach McElroy, please. Okay, come here. <laughs> Hometown in Twinsburg, right? Uh, not much different, I don't know. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, President of SPS, Choose Ohio First Scholar, uh, founder of uh, Round Net Club. That's uh, Spike Ball. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, uh, and uh, Dean's List every semester, so that's really gr great. Uh, what else? Enjoy watching the, De the Detroit Lions, Star Wars, playing uh, Spike Ball and tennis and hanging with friends. Okay. 
All right, senior project, Star Palkas with Dr. Kiho from SMU. And thank you, thank you very much. Okay, next is uh, George, George Pantilemon, please. Okay, well, no beard and uh, uh, SPS event coordinator, surf participant, 2021, Sigma Pi Sigma member, Dean's List every semester, pro gamer, uh, expert in pool and table tennis, good, and uh, senior project uh, Star Pulses, again with Dr. Kehoe uh, from uh, SMU, and thank you, thank you, George. Right, uh, Michael Roth, thank you. Yes, please do come here. Thank you. Okay, uh, hometown, Lorain, Ohio, uh, and uh, uh, NSF STEM uh, Middle Scholarship, surf recipient. Enjoys working for IT, yes, he worked a lot here for four years. Uh, video editing and building uh, Gunpla models and uh, uh, future plans, uh, MS in mechanical or energy engineering. His senior project is modeling of future solar cell materials. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Okay, here comes Van, Van Tran, please. Well, uh, hometown, Sagan, Vietnam, worked as a math tutor, uh, enjoyed hiking, uh, Korean fashion, and listening uh, uh, to niche R&B artists, future plans, graduate school. Senior project is control of cursor using brain-computer interface, BCI. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Gabe is here. Gabe Williford. <laughs> Hometown, uh, Bainbridge, Ohio, SPS Financial Advisor, internships with National Polymer, uh, Sigma Pi, Sigma Inductee, Future Plans, Deciding. <laughs> Admitted to two MS programs and in discussion with Sun Chemical, uh, a lot different than his freshman picture, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, uh, senior project, uh, spin uh, coatings with National Polymer. Thank you, thank you, Gabe. <laughs> Victoria is here. Okay, Victoria can stop. How do you think? Any change or not? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Victoria, hometown, uh, Twinsburg, Ohio, G uh, healthcare intern. Uh, enjoys piano, reading, di uh, reading, diamond painting, and traveling. Future plans still undecided, considering uh, engineering jobs. Uh, senior project is automated music playback directly from sheet music. Thank you, Victoria. Okay, uh, the last person here is Max, uh, Max Campbell. He's our 3-2 uh, 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 engineer guy and um, on a 3-2 program. Uh, three, uh, three years with John Carroll and two years he's doing it case Western Reserve University. He's not here, uh, uh, but he's uh, doing a, a Bachelor of Applied Science and Biomedical Medical Engineering. Uh, he shared us this picture with us today which is basically uh, an Arduino-based uh, uh, central hub of the sports fitness monitoring system. Uh, so uh, he'll be graduating uh, this year as well. 
Okay, so these were all our uh, uh, graduating seniors. Uh, now I would like to move to uh, the special award. Right. Okay. And, uh, right. Uh, so a couple of special awards. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, for is, uh, Joseph Hunter Award. Uh, and I will uh, give a little bit of background about, uh, about this award. Uh, this award was established, uh, this is John uh, Hunter Award, and this award was established in 1978 on the retirement of uh, Joe Hunter, who was a distinguished member of the physics faculty and a fellow of both the American Physical Society and the Acoustical uh, uh, Society of America. He joined the department in 1946 and instituted the program in electronics uh, the pred uh, the pred uh, pred uh, predecessor of uh, the current engineering physics degree. Uh, his uh, studies of the propagation of ultrasound and liquids helped establish the tradition of research in the department. In recognition of this award, the name uh, of the recipient has been already added to the, to the plaque of award winners, which are here. Uh, this year's uh, Joseph L. Hunter Award goes to George Pentilemon for outstanding for outstanding scholarship by a civic major. Part of this award is still in transit, and uh, it's Amazon who has somehow they, they decided to delay part of that award. So uh, it will arrive uh, in a few days. So let's have a picture here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our next award is uh, uh, Lawrence uh, Monville Award. This award is named in honor of Father uh, Monville, who founded the physics department and was chairman from 1942 to 1965. He retired from teaching in 1974 and passed away in 1989. His services to the department and the high esteem of his colleagues and students is signified by this award, which was established in 1967. In recognition of this award, the recipient's name is added to the uh, plaque of award winners in the Department of Physics. This year, Lawrence Monville Award goes to Zach McElroy and uh, for outstanding scholarship uh, by uh, a graduating senior majoring in our department, Zach. This award is still in transit, so <laughs> it's still in transit. Uh, again, Amazon is somehow slow. Uh, I don't know why. Okay, good. Our final award for this evening uh, is the 2023 uh, uh, Distinguished Alum uh, Alumnus Award. This award is for professional achievement and uh, for services to the physics department in John Carroll University. This year, the 2023 Distinguished uh, Alumnus Award goes to Melissa McGuire, class of 1990, and a member of Society of Physics Students. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit more description here about her. Uh, Melissa McGuire started her career at NASA Glenn Research Center in 1992. Uh, her career has been as an aerospace engineer specialization, specializing in low and high thrust mission design and analysis. She is currently the chief of NASA Glenn Research Center Mission Architecture and Analysis Branch, as well as the mission design lead of NASA's power and, propuls and propulsion element, PPE, and serves as the mission design deputy for NASA's gateway. Uh, 
She has spent a great deal of her career performing mission design and architecture of both robotic and human missions to Mars and other targets of uh, potential interest to human and robotic uh, exploration in 2006. She was one of the two founding members of the NASA GRC concurrent engineering compass team, which has been responsible for over 200 conceptual designs of space ap uh, applications, ranging from lunar communication test beds to submarines to spacecraft capable of uh, redirecting asteroids and human round trip vehicles for future Mars missions. Ms. Maguire received her BS in engineering physics from John Carroll University and an MS in aerospace engineering from the University of Cincinnati. She lives with her husband and two, and, and two children, both of whom will be away at college this fall. Uh, without further ado, please join me in congratulating uh, you know, Melissa Maguire for getting this award. have the right screen set up. And I gave you too much of a bio because I don't have a lot left to say now in my presentation. <laughs> so hello, my name is Melissa McGuire. I'm class of 1990, so I went here to John Carroll, but this building is new to me because I was in the old uh, Bohanian Science Center. Um, and I didn't have time to find any of my old pictures of when I went to school here. I wanted to get some of like the library we used to hang out in down the hallway from Dr. Fitch's office. Um, and I don't necessarily need this to be formal, so if you want to stop me and ask me questions about anything, feel free. I know I'm the last thing in the evening and you might be tired and ready to go, but feel free to stop. So I was born and raised here in Cleveland. I grew up in North Olmsted, Ohio, so I'm a West Sider. Um, I always wanted to work at NASA. Being on the West Side, you know, the hangars right there by the airport, I always knew that the NASA Center was there and it was something that I'd always uh, dreamed to work at. I did my junior high school shadowing there. I spent a couple weeks uh, my high school required all juniors to do something in a career fear field that they might be interested in working in, and I wanted to work at NASA, so I worked with a couple different engineers for a couple weeks, and I still fell in love with it. Um, so then I came here to John Carroll, and I got a bachelor's in engineering physics, uh, graduating in 1990. And then after here, I heard a lot of your, the seniors were trying to decide what to do in the fall. That fall, I went and got my master's in aerospace engineering. I was actually enrolled at the University of Cincinnati to get my PhD, but I stopped after my master's and started working um, at NASA. Um, so I also, I wanted to, to add in there, so a number of you may not, not be staying in physics or you're thinking about going into engineering. There's this thing that engineers don't necessarily think physicists uh, can hack it at engineering, but I found when I went into aerospace engineering, they had me take a couple of classes to fill in some things like fluid mechanics and things like that that I hadn't taken as an undergraduate. Fluids is very suspiciously like electricity and magnetism, so everything Dr. LaCueva had taught me in ENM absolutely translated and I did better than most of the engineers in the class. Um, so physics, is, it paid off. Um, so let's see, while I was in school here, actually I was just talking to, to Dr. Fitch about this, Two summers between my junior year and then after my senior year, I did internships at NASA, then Lewis Research Center, um, looking at studying, um, I was in a lab. They were looking at using fiber optics to replace electrical wiring in airplanes. And so I was taking a bunch of test data for that group. Um, when I went to graduate school, the two summers there, so the summer after my first year of graduate school, summer after I was finishing my master's, I started working with the group that I'm now the branch chief of at NASA. I think it was still Lewis at the time Research Center. So we were, um, I, what I was doing there was resurrecting codes to model nuclear reactors in space to be used to power nuclear rockets to send humans to Mars. So back in 91, 92, in the beginning of my career, I was doing a lot of analysis on uh, human missions to Mars. And all of the trajectory designs I was running at the time had us leaving in 2017, 2018, so we'd have been there and back by now if we'd have kept those schedules. Um, 
while I was at the University of Cincinnati, like I said, I was enrolled for my PhD. I started as a research assistant. Um, I actually started in the propulsion discipline of aerospace engineering. I switched to dynamics and control. In propulsion, I was a research assistant. When I switched my disciplines, I became a te teaching assistant. And so I taught a couple labs um, in their propulsion group. Um, and then I didn't stay after I got my master's and I ended up working at NASA Glenn. But first I started as a contractor. So at all of the NASA centers, there are support service contractors and then there are civil servants. So civil servants are technically government employees, but that's about half of the folks who work there. The other half of them are contractors. So I started with a contracting company there called Analex. It's no longer there. And there are several other contractors now who have our engineering contracts. Um, and I was a contractor until 1990 in the same group that I'm working in now. And then I became a civil servant. Um, I'm gonna go over, I think, a lot of what I work on. And you, and you already mentioned part of it. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of just the pictures of, of what my focus has been. So I do mission design or trajectory design. And everything I do is space. So all of the aero stuff that I had learned, I don't have to worry about it anymore because I only have to worry about how things move around in space, no atmospheres to worry about. And I do trajectory design. So that's basically following the physics of how objects move in space, um, gravitational pulls of one another. And if you wanna take a spacecraft from one point and send it to another point, uh, maybe you do a few flybys, um, maybe it's just a simple home and transfer. But um, trajectory design, and uh, as I mentioned in the bio, for all sorts of different missions, whether it's a robotic mission where you're not really worried about how quickly you can get the object there, but probably more um, how much propellant it would cost you, maybe how expensive your launch vehicle would be, um, how much mass you can deliver. Or if you're sending people, time is much more of a factor because you don't want to have people in interplanetary space for a long amount of time. Um, so most of my work up to now has been feasibility studies. So what, was, what does the technology need to be to send whatever it is we need to send to wherever we want to send it? And because NASA Glenn is primarily a research center, a lot of the analysis that our group would do were, would be to create reference missions of if you were to develop these kinds of thrusters, or if you were to advance the solar ray technology like this, or if your communication system had been advanced like this, what kind of missions could you achieve? Um, which led to the Compass team which you mentioned also. So in 2006, a uh, colleague, uh, Steve Olson, and I started the, what's called the Compass Team. It's a concurrent engineering team. It's very much like a college team where we get seven to 10 engineers in a room who are experts in their different disciplines, all the disciplines that you need to build a spacecraft. And we build a conceptual spacecraft to accomplish a mission in two weeks time. And when we build it, we have like a, a bottoms up menu of all the pieces, parts, how much it would weigh, an idea of the volume. Um, you can see some pictures of some of the things that we've designed. We've done over a, a couple hundred designs. I think they're nearing in on 300, I'm not really sure. And not just spacecraft, we've done a lot of landed things lately. Um, actually, I'm no longer with the team, although the management of the team is out of my branch. So as the chief of the branch, which I'll mention in a minute, um, I sort of manage the folks who are doing all of this, but we've been focusing a lot on how to get um, oxygen out of the surface of the moon in support of all the lunar surface missions that we're trying to, to fly. But when we, when we get together, the folks, we have like a thermal person, a comm person, um, a structures person, a propulsion system person, and we get them all in the room at one time and we create magic in just a couple weeks. Okay. I'm also, in 2018, I became the chief, the branch chief of the branch that I had grown up in when I finished my master's. So we're called the uh, Mission Architecture and Analysis Branch. Every time NASA Glenn does a reorganization, our branch gets a new name. So that's the name that it's been since at least 2016, I think. Um, what are the specs of this branch? So we have 21 civil servants, that's including myself. Um, so I mentioned that those are government employees. We also have uh, five support service contractors. So we're really a group of about 26 people. And we work on sort of four key areas in support. So the trajectory design, the mission design that I mentioned, that's one of the main core areas. Um, and I'm gonna get into some of the things that our mission designers are focusing on. Um, we also have the Compass team that I mentioned, and what our branch brings to that is the trajectory designers, like I mentioned, but we also have the lead of the Compass team is out of our group, 
And what's called a lead systems engineer is out of our group. So the systems engineer's job, which was the one I originated, um, they're responsible for pulling it all together. So I would come up with the, the sort of grocery list of the spacecraft of all the pieces, parts, and I would get each of those disciplines to fill in their pieces. And then I was responsible for roping it all together. So, but we also provide guidance, navigation, and control support for that spacecraft design. And our G, N, and C capabilities is more than just for the compass team. So guidance, navigation, and control, you've got the spacecraft that you want to fly a certain trajectory, but it's going to have to point a certain way. It needs to move in a certain fashion. It needs to be moved, moved fast enough to get to where you need to. You need to decide what sort of hardware implements that. Um, in the compass team, that's what the person's responsible for doing um, in the GNC area. We also support Orion. So Artemis 1 just flew. The Orion was the crewed vehicle. Well, it was unmanned at the time when it flew. Our group is responsible for doing verification and validation of all the flight software that's on the Orion. And that's the guidance, navigation, and control part of it. So Lockheed Martin is building the Orion for NASA Glenn, and we're verifying everything that Lockheed's doing. So we had folks who were they weren't on console, but they were sort of the backup room for the folks who were on console while Orion was flying. So not just when SLS launched it, those first few hours, but during the course of that whole 30 days that it was flying through space, our folks were supporting that mission. Um, we also have folks in the branch. To do all of this, we have to build our own tools. A lot of this doesn't exist. I can't just go buy a software program to do the sorts of analyses that we do here. So we build them ourselves. Okay, so I mentioned Artemis. So in addition to being the branch chief, I'm also uh, the mission design manager for the power propulsion element and then the deputy for the gateway. So I'm gonna walk you to, through Artemis and what's going on there, um, and then my part of it. So um, Artemis is our return to the moon. So Apollo was what we did in the 60s. Our new return to the moon for NASA is now called Artemis. And the first part of that um, Artemis 1 was just successfully completed. So we had, I don't know if anybody watched, uh, Artemis 1's launch and Orion's successful flight. The piece that I'm involved in is two over, it's called the Gateway. So there's a, it's a science operations center, it's a platform that we're going to build in an orbit near the moon. Um, the first two elements of the Gateway are what my team is going to be responsible for delivering there. And the Gateway will support Artemis for the surface lunar missions that are long duration. So um, in, in 2017, we announced that we were gonna return to the moon. Um, and in order to move past this and not just have these touchdown landings where we'll go to the surface and come back in a couple days, we wanna to try to build a long surface presence at the south pole of the moon, different than Apollo, where Apollo was equatorial. Um, there's a lot of challenges to land somebody, land humans at the South Pole of the Moon and be able to speak with them long term. Um, the South Pole is interesting because we believe there's water there, there's frozen water, so we want to try to go and exploit those re um, resources. But you can't always see from Earth the South Pole like you could the equator of the Moon that faced the Earth. So the Gateway is going to be primarily a big communication relay to allow us to speak to the um, astronauts who will be on the surface and relay that information back to uh, the Earth. It's also an outpost. It'll buy down some of the delta V that your spacecraft or the propulsion um, propellant that your spacecraft will have to carry in order to be able to do these missions and go down to the surface of the moon. Um, when you're, when, like Apollo, um, when you were in orbit about the moon, you were tugged by the moon a lot. You needed a lot of propellant. If you were going to stay there for a long time, the moon's awfully lumpy, so the gravity pull would be different as you're going around the orbit. Those missions were not very long. Part of Apollo that stayed uh, the orbiter that stayed around the moon didn't have to stay for a very long time. We're hoping for these missions to be much longer. If we keep the gateway in an orbit near the moon, which I'm going to talk to you about, the propulsive capabilities that we need to stay there are much lower. Um, and we sort of allow the other spacecraft that are supporting the lunar missions, we sort of offload some of the work that they have to do. Okay. So the pieces, the first two pieces of the gateway that will be delivered, Right now, we're called the Co-Manifest Vehicle. It's not a very fancy name, and I think eventually we're going to get a, a new name. It just hasn't been rolled out yet. But my part is the power and propulsion element. We are going to launch with a habitat and logistics outpost called HALO. The two of us will be mated on the pad. The PPE will then deliver both of those to this orbit that I've mentioned. Um, 
when we we originally going to launch both of those separately back in 2020 the decision was made to launch them together and let the PPE push the two of them when we when we did that we became the CMV the co-manifest vehicle um, how this flight's going to work and I'm going to show you some graphics of it in a little trajectory movie in a little bit um, we're using a, a, a low thrust electric propulsion system so the cathode technology that you were talking about helps to drive this system where we ionize a noble gas and then shoot those electrons out the back end of the thrusters. That's the blue glow you see there. Um, it's very efficient, takes a long time, but you can deliver a lot of mass, a lot more mass than a chemical system doing the same sort of mission could do. All right, so this is a little bit about the electric propulsion system. Now, I'm not an electric propulsion engineer. Um, I really didn't like circuits, and I didn't necessarily like ENN. That's sort of why I went into aerospace engineering. But I know how to apply these. So I think the folks here probably know a lot more of what goes into the cathode design and the, the electric propulsion system itself. And I think uh, one of you is going to go into solar cell uh, development, I think. Yeah, so we have some really high power solar uh, arrays on this PPE. So this is gonna be the largest solar electric propulsion system that's ever flown. We take power from the sun through our huge arrays and we're gonna power some high power electric propulsion thrusters and they're higher power than have ever been thrown, flown before. Maxar Technologies is building the spacecraft, um, the, the PPE, and NASA Glenn is managing it. I think I talked a little bit about there. Um, NASA Glenn's going to, it, we're managing the build of it, and then my team is responsible for designing the trajectory that it's going to fly and implementing that trajectory um, so that it will fly itself and the halo to the NRHO. So, um, I don't think I have more about that. No, I'll keep going. Okay, so where are we going? We're flying to a near rectilinear halo orbit. So this is a unique orbit. I have a couple charts on it. Uh, near the moon. So like I mentioned for Apollo, there were those low lunar orbits that we put there very simple um, little Hohmann transfers and that's where the Apollo missions would stay when the crew would go to the surface and come back again. We're deploying the PBE and then building the gateway in an orbit that's a semi-stable orbit and it's a third three body orbit. So it's sort of at the distance of the moon from the earth. So it's it's sort of an orbit about the Earth, but because it's at the moon's distance, it's also tugged by the moon. And if you're on the surface of the Earth and you're looking at a spacecraft in this orbit, it'll look like as it goes around, it's making a halo about the moon. But it's really jumping over and under the moon as it goes around the Earth. It's semi-stable. I'll show you a little piece here. So um, if you notionally think of the gravitational pulls of the Earth-Moon system as these um, sort of wells in space. The Earth has a larger gravity than the Moon. To get away from the Earth, it takes a lot of energy to pull yourself up out of that um, well. The Moon, a little bit less gravity, but you still have to pull yourself up out of it. Our halo orbit, the near rectilinear halo orbit that we're going to be deployed in is that yellow orbit that's about the Moon, and it's kind of balanced between the gravity of the Moon and the Earth. But it's semi-stable. It's not 100% stable, meaning you'll need active propellant, uh, active propulsion to stay in that orbit. Because if you don't, depending on where you are in it, you may come down to the moon, or you may go out into the heliosphere space, or you may be pulled back to the Earth. So the power and propulsion element is going to allow us to stay there. So um, it's three main, the PPE's three main usage is, is the power big solar arrays, it will brought, it'll generate power for itself and for the rest of the gateway. Propulsion, we'll have these electric propulsion system on board that allow us to stay there. So propulsion to keep the rest of the gateway there. And then it has the communication systems to be able to support the lunar missions. Okay. Um, this is very quickly, there's a few different ways to get to the moon. Our power and propulsion element is going to be that big string of redness on the far left. Um, so Orion, when it joins us, it's going to join us in the um, NRHO and dock to the gateway. It's going to be kind of, it's going to be direct. So three to five days to get to the moon, similar to the Apollo missions. It does several burns and it inserts itself there. It has to use a lot of propellant to do that. So the ML, it needs that big SLS launch um, and a lot of propellant to deliver itself. A way you can buy down the amount of propellant you need 
is to do the one in the middle now. It's called a ballistic lunar transfer. So um, ballistic lunar transfer also can, uses a chemical burn, but you get out far and you actually use the sun to help pull your orbit around before you come back and then let the moon help capture you in. So because you've borrowed energy from the sun and the moon, you don't have to carry as much propellant. You can deliver a little bit more uh, payload there. The low thrust spiral that we're going to do with the power and propulsion element though beats both of them by a wide mile, but it, it's the cost of time. So what we're going to do is we're going to launch into, let's see if I have this picture. It's, in the, it's closer. So we're gonna launch into sort of a medium orbit, almost a, the transfer orbit that a communication satellite would use to go get to geo. And then we're gonna slowly add energy, um, raising our apogee and our perigee, if you're pretending the Earth is here, over time until we get close enough to the moon that we can then allow the moon to pull us in. Um, in the graphic here, and I'll just go to, I'm gonna skip through those, I'll go to the movie. This is one of our design reference missions that we created, but it's publicly releasable, so it's okay for me to share it here. We keep adding energy um, in the graphic. Blue is coasting. We coast for a bit when we check out the spacecraft. Red is thrusting. Um, we thrust almost the entire time as we're getting up toward the moon. As we get close to the moon's orbit, uh, we'll go blue, um, and that will be coasting. And then we'll let the moon pull us in, and we do a few more burns to insert. So at the top, you can see how we're, I think the top is, yes, the top is the moon. Um, so we'll get closer and closer to the moon. And then the bottom of the graph on the left-hand side, um, we're gonna, gonna get closer and closer to the moon. You'll see uh, as the moon goes around, as we get to the end of our mission, we'll get closer to the moon. The teal on that graph is us getting farther and farther away from the earth. We are launched at the Cape, so 28 and a half degree inclination to the earth. We don't really take any of that inclination out by doing our electric propulsion thrusting. We're gonna let the moon help us do that, so we're borrowing energy for the moon as well. For electric propulsion, for the amount of prop that we bring, with the energy that we put into the orbit, almost, well, a great deal of it gets put into energy in the orbit. So we're not having to carry as much propellant to deliver as much mass. Okay. I don't know how hard that was to see. Should I play it again or keep going? I'll keep going. And then that was me. So we're hoping to launch um, in just a few years. I don't know how, if the launch dates are all out there yet, but going back to Artemis, we're, at, we're after Artemis three, around Artemis four timeline for um, Orion's launches. And the power propulsion element will be up there. Um, it's going to have a 15 year life as part of the gateway. We'll be assembling the gateway. It's an international uh, affair, so uh, Canada, Japan, and the European Space Agency will be bringing up pieces as we build Gateway up in the NRHO and support those lunar missions. And then I've let, I've, I can leave these with you. So I have my contact information if you in the department, although you guys have my email so you can get in touch with me. Um, but that, that's what's keeping me busy right now. Um, and I appreciate you listening. So if there are any questions, I'll take them too. Thank you. So it's going to take you a year to get your uh, uh, communication link up there. It will. So you launch ahead. We do, yes. Right. Yes, so it'll take it to everybody here, the question. We're going to have to launch ahead of Orion to arrive, and it will take us about a year to spiral out there. I will mention also the two pieces together. There is no currently launching launch vehicle commercial launch vehicle that could send them both to the moon. So the only way to get them up there is to use the power propulsion element to deliver both masses. But yes, we need to deploy first and get there and check out before Orion tries to come up. You don't have a launch? So I don't know that it's public. I do have a launch date that I'm working toward. <laughs> I was trying to use all publicly available things soon. here. <laughs> has to be so. It, yes. Any other questions? Yes. Just out of curiosity, what uh, tools do you use to simulate the things like Corvus and Plaza? Sure. So we have several tools that are built within, I guess they're in the agency. A couple of them are open source. So there's one called Copernicus. 
It was developed by a professor at the University of Texas in Austin, but NASA Johnson has taken over the development of the tool. Um, it's what they used to develop the trajectories for Orion. It's not necessarily the best tool to develop a low thrust mission um, with these electric thrusters. So we've worked with the developers to have them alter it in ways we need them to, or we write scripts in Python to run it from the outside. So that's one of the tools. Another one is called GMAT that Goddard Space Flight Center developed. Um, I think there is an open source version of Goddard's GMAT that you might be able to get your hands on. Copernicus, you would have to have um, you would need to ask for it from NASA, and I, I don't know if John Carroll could get access to it, but maybe. Um, let's see, we built a lot of things ourselves. There's another tool that we've used called Otis that our, our center, and actually my branch, is responsible for developing. It's been designated um, ITAR, so it, it's international, no, regulation, arms treaty, I can't remember what ITAR stands for. So, traffic? Traffic and arms, okay. So um, you have to have a contract with the government and show need for the tool. Although we're making a non-ITAR version, we're hoping to put that out soon. So anybody who's working on it, US citizen could get your hands on it. Um, and there's a tool called STK, fairly expensive. Um, for simplified trajectory design, I know a lot of folks in undergraduate and graduate school like use MATLAB and from first principles can write their own scripts and things to, to simulate it. You could also use Python, um, but that's what we run. Anything else? It's, it's a, yes? I'm really curious about, so you showed us the, the little trajectory, the yellow trajectory that you're going to be in around the moon. Oh, yes. Yes. So is this important? Yes, that's it's a really good question. So the Lagrange points have been known for a long time. So in every two body system, there are points and they're marked on this graphic too. You see an L1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The Lagrange points have been known for a while. Uh, the Lagrange points of the Jupiter Sun system are where the Trojan asteroids and the Greek asteroids are. Right? So there's no propulsion necessary to keep those asteroids there. The asteroid belts exist because that's a gravitational pull balance between Jupiter and the Sun. So the fact that there are these Lagrange points has existed for a long time. A lot of work has been done though to understand if those are points or if there's regions around them. And I actually thought about putting some of the movies that my colleague Diane Davis at Johnson has put together on her studying the NRHO. Um, there's a lot of work that Purdue has been doing. There's their airspace department there. Um, I don't know besides Purdue who's been studying the NRHO as much. And so they just sort of started as these Lagrange points existed. Are they just points in space or are, are they regions? And so Purdue's been doing a lot of analysis on whether they are regions or not. When we were starting to think up the gateway, we wanted to put it a place by the moon that could stay for a long time, but didn't require constant refuels or really big propulsion systems to stay. The International Space Station is sort of low to the earth and it is constantly coming down. We have to reboost it. And that's easy enough to do since it's only a couple hundred kilometers above the surface of the earth, but we are talking, you know, at the moon several days away on a high propulsion system. So we started studying multiple different options in the cislunar space of places where we might put this. And the NRHO, and actually there's a so bonus about this NRHO, um, the NRHO seemed from a propulsion standpoint really attractive. And then also really attractive from a communication standpoint. You, in theory, can look at the Earth all the time, depending on where you put that halo. Another thing that we've done, or some of the folks at Johnson who were looking at the, the NRHOs figured out, is depending on that size of that halo orbit and how long it takes a spacecraft to get around it while the moon is going around the Earth, you can phase those two things to have a spacecraft that's in it avoid any shadows from that the Earth would, so any Earth shadows. So this one is called a nine to two residence, resonance NRHO. So a spacecraft in it will go around the moon nine times for two times of the moon's passage around the Earth. 
And that works out so that I think there's maybe two eclipses in the 15 years gateway lifespan from our simulations. So they started out mostly as academic and then NASA started looking at applications. Any other, that was a good question. More question? Okay. All right, well thank you very much okay. for having me here. Thank you uh, very much, everyone.